Good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Anwar Bukhars, and I'm a professor of counterterrorism uh, and counterviolent extremism here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Uh, I want to extend a very uh, warm welcome to the many Africa uh, Center alumni, distinguished colleagues, and friends who have joined us today for this um, for this webinar, sizing up the Islamic State in the Great Year. Uh, Sahara. And now I would like to pass it over to our uh, acting and, and deputy director, Daniel Hampton, to say a few words about the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bukars. So good afternoon, uh, good morning, depending on where you're connecting from. Bonjour à tous. And thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and for your interest in this program. Welcome. As Dr. Bukars mentioned, my name is Daniel Hampton. And I am the Deputy Director and the current Acting Director for the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. I know many of you are familiar with the Africa Center, uh, but for those who are not, and a refresher for those who are, the Africa Center was established by our Congress in 1999 for the study of security issues relating to Africa and serving as a forum for research, communication, and exchange of ideas. To achieve this mandate given to us by Congress, we've developed this mission statement, to advance African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. Within the Africa Center, we're organized around three pillars to execute our mission. First, our academic affairs section, which organizes seminars, workshops, webinars, events, such as the one you're participating in today on topical issues and relevant security issues in Africa. Second is our research and strategic communications section. If you're not familiar with our website, africacenter.org, I would strongly encourage you to check it out and use it as a resource. In addition to keeping all our publications on that website in PDF, downloadable format in PDF, we have them in English, French, some in Portuguese, and some in Arabic. We also post regular spotlights, which are short blog pieces on current and relevant issues, and infographics on key topics impacting the African security landscape. Please use this. It's a great resource. Again, africacenter.org. And then our third pillar is our community and alumni affairs section. I mentioned that our mission statement, one part of it is building and sustaining enduring partnerships. And that is what this section does. So for us, it's more than just your participation in this event today. It's a connection with the Africa Center. We wanna build a larger community of interest, a community of practitioners who are interested in African security issues passionate about security and stability in Africa, and we want to be there for you as a resource. So we hope today is not just a one-off, that you stay connected to us and be part of our larger Africa Center family. Now today I'm excited about this webinar as we take an in-depth look at the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara. If you think about VEO, this group puts the V in VEO. They're a very violent organization. I think you'll hear more about that today. And it's an interesting group. ISGS has a history of both cooperation and contestation with other Salafi jihadist groups in the Sahel, uh, particularly with JNIM. Uh, they share a similar recruitment pool. Uh, there's been defections into that. Again, I'm sure you'll hear more about it today. And in particularly in light of the changing security situation in the Sahel with the uh, situation in Mali and Burkina Faso with the government changes there, uh, with the French and uh, their mission in Mali and, and what's happening there, and also with the, uh, the UN peacekeeping mission. All, all part of this greater dynamic. So this is a really timely discussion. I think it's it's going to be great. I'm looking forward to it, and we're ready to go. So Dr. Ruhars, uh, back to you to kick us off. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, now let's begin um, our session. Uh, about uh, two months ago, exactly on April 7th, uh, we convened a webinar uh, here at the Africa Center that provided an in-depth look at the origins, the aims, and drivers of Al-Qaeda-affiliated uh, Jamaat, Nusrat al-Islam al-Muslimin, a coalition in the Sahel. 
uh, JNM. Uh, and the panelists, <clears throat> you know, Kamisa Kamara and Rida Yamuri and Hini Saibia, I think they did a very good job providing us with an understanding uh, of the composition, <clears throat> the motivations and objectives of this group, as well as the drivers and enabling factors of JNM. Uh, we also came out of the webinar with better clarity of the <clears throat> political economy of violent extremism in the central uh, Sahel countries, <clears throat> mainly Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. And you can listen to the whole uh, event in our website. So <clears throat> by going to the africacenter.org uh, slash CVE. And today, you know, we have uh, uh, with us I mean, panelists that will help us understand another <clears throat> violent extremist group. This time, it's the so-called Islamic State in the Great Year Sahara. So panelists will explore the, <clears throat> the origins, you know, the aims and, and drivers of the so-called Islamic State uh, in the Great Year Sahara. And their analysis will consider dynamics in the group's composition, uh, its objectives, <clears throat> as well as again, you know, the political drivers, the economic drivers that have enabled <clears throat> this group to become a, a formidable force. Uh, in the Sahel. So as we discussed uh, <clears throat> on April 7th, I mean, the last three years have seen an escalation in violence. It has seen an escalation in mass killings, you know, civilians, <clears throat> and also soldiers, you know, security services in the Sahel. In the border, in the three borders region, <clears throat> linking Mali, uh, Niger, uh, and Burkina Faso, uh, the so-called Islamic State in the greater Sahara has killed <clears throat> hundreds of defense and security forces, and it has massacred scores of civilians. <clears throat> but despite the dramatic escalation of violence, despite the dramatic spike <clears throat> in terrorism, I mean, surprisingly little is known about the deadliest uh, group in the Sahel, how this group is, is governed how it makes political decisions, you know, how it uses violence <clears throat> and how it, you know, respond to its constituencies. <clears throat> so without an accurate understanding, if you think of the group's membership structure, uh, you know, of the group's earnings, strategies and priorities, I think the efforts of states and regional authorities, as well as international actors, you know, to deal with this group are not likely to succeed. So I think this webinar will help us, uh, will help facilitate this process of understanding uh, ISGS, so-called Islamic State in Greater Sahara, by providing an in-depth analysis of the characteristics of the group nearly two years after the killing of its leader, uh, Adnan Walid Sahrawi. The webinar will give us an analysis uh, of the political and economic factors that, that have enabled uh, the group to, um, to, uh, to persist. Uh, so to help unpack, to help us unpack all of this, uh, I mean, we had uh, invited two, two panelists. Uh, one panelist is, is uh, we're having an emergency, so uh, he has not been able to, to join us. Uh, and that was Ibrahim Yahya. Uh, Ibrahim of the International uh, uh, Crisis Crisis Group, and then we have with us uh, Hassan uh, uh, Kony. He's a senior uh, researcher at the Regional Office for West Africa, the Sahel, a uh, Lake Chad Basin of the Institute for Security Studies. He's a Mauritanian national uh, and a retired colonel of the National Gendarmerie. He has thirty-four years of experience in the various fields of security. And during his career, he served for 20 years in the intelligence service and 40 years in the office of the judicial police uh, of his country's force. He also served between 2012 and 2016 as a military attache at the Mauritanian embassy in Mali with accreditation to, to Niger and Burkina Faso. In this, in this capacity, he served as a liaison officer uh, with the, the, the commands of the French Operation Serval 
the African-led international support mission to Mali, MISMA, and then MINUSMA, the United Nations Multidimensional Integrated Stabilization Mission. And as part of his duties, he has been involved in numerous investigations uh, into terrorism and drug trafficking you know, that took place in Mauritania and the region. He has also been uh, involved in, in activities with the framework of how do you manage the Malian crisis. He took part in negotiations and implementation of the Ouagadougou Agreement of June uh, 2013, the Kidal uh, ceasefire of May 2014, and then of the Algiers Agreement of May 2015. And in 2016, he had been appointed uh, Inspector General of the Armed and Security Forces of Mauritania. So having retired in August 2019, he entered the ISS in September uh, <clears throat> 2019. Um, so my, uh, uh, my colleague just informed me, in fact, that, uh, that Ibrahim has just joined us, uh, which, is, which is terrific. And Ibrahim Yahya Ibrahim is, a, as I said, is a senior uh, analyst with the International uh, Crisis Group. And he gained a PhD in political science from the University of Florida where he's also a co-founder and research associate um, with the Sahel Research Group. He worked with NGOs in Niger, including as the executive uh, director of the Niger office of Al-Basar International Foundation. And he has a background in sociology, Islamic jurisprudence, and, uh, and management. Okay, so I was going to start with uh, uh, with with Ibrahim uh, to walk us through, you know, this group, Islamic State in Greater Sahara, you know, its origins and aims and, and drivers, because it's 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 critical that we understand uh, the workings, you know, of violent extremist groups. I think we have to understand what are the objectives uh, of this group, uh, along with the with the structures and. And, 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 and strategies of it. So, hi, Ibrahim. Glad you could, you could join us. So if you can unmute, uh, I'll, I'll start with, with you uh, and I'll ask you the, the first questions. First question, so if you can you know, walk us through you know, the, the Islamic State, Greater Sahara, its origins, you know, its aims and, 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 and drivers. Uh, well, well, thank you very much, and um, it's Perfect. really an honor to be um, a part of this panel and um, uh, to, to speak about these um, crucial problems um, uh, that, that the Sahel um, is facing, um, and um, the ISGS insurgency is one of them. Um, so quickly, I, I will go ahead and uh, answer the question that, that you just asked. Um, something. I think there are three facets of this question. You are asking about the origin, you are asking about the purpose um, or the aim that, that they are trying to achieve, and um, uh, you are also asking a question about the drivers. Um, so quickly, starting with the origins um, of, of um, uh, the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara, um, I think it, this can be traced back um, to the earlier contact between the Algerian jihadists um, uh, uh, and, and the smugglers and the businessmen um, from Gao. And uh, actually, this can go back really very far, um, um, up to uh, 1990s. Um, in the late 1990s, this is when um, this uh, contact started. Um, and then it evolved in the 2000s um, of the Algerian jihadists establishing bases. Uh, in Northern Mali um, and uh, kidnapping Westerners and bringing them in Northern Mali. And then you have uh, Northern Malians, um, uh, uh, you know, intermediating um, uh, to, to, to release those, those hostages. Uh, so, so relationship got, got stronger um, uh, during the 2000s um, uh, as this interconnection uh, was going on um, and uh, smuggling uh, and kidnapping of, for ransom was, 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 uh, was get, getting ground in Northern Mali. And then in 2011, um, uh, we have internal uh, dissensions within uh, the Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb uh, that led to the creation of uh, Mujaw. And Mujaw was created by um, uh, you know, jihadists uh, from Northern Mali, from the Arab community of Tlemcen, 
um, and uh, with uh, Mauritanians and the some Sahrawis who have um, a long, uh, you know, background to southern Algeria and then jihadist groups. Um, they got together uh, because of this dissension. They got together to create Mujaw, um, and Mujaw is a movement of oneness and jihad in West Africa, um, uh, which occupied Gao uh, in 2012 um, uh, during um, the, the the major insurgency that they conducted. Um, and then, uh, um, you know, and this is a coalition of, of several groups I can come back to talk about um, how Muja was formed and uh, who were the constituents of the group. It is really very diverse of people with a lot of different backgrounds. But this is an initial group um, that evolved to become uh, ISGS. In 2013, there was Intervention, intervention Serval, um, the French military intervention that um, you know, uh, expelled those jihadist groups from the towns that they controlled uh, in northern Mali. Um, and then uh, starting from 2014, many of, uh, some of the leaders were killed and some of them uh, went underground and particularly around the border between Niger and, and Mali, uh, where the base of, where the base of IAGS is uh, located now. Um, so it, in, in 2015, they um, declared their allegiance to, uh, to, to the Islamic uh, State in Iraq and Syria, ISIS, um, but that allegiance was only accepted um, in, uh, in 2016 um, by, by al-Baghdadi. Um, uh, and then, so, so this is quickly, I think, the, the, to sum up um, how they evolved um, chronologically um, from uh, this early uh, uh, contact with the, the smugglers and, and, and uh, the, the, the jihadists in, in, in southern Algeria up to the creation of the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara. I'm happy to answer all the questions um, to go deep into, into each one of this, um, of this period. Now, what, what purpose is uh, the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara pursuing? And this is a jihadist group, and so it pursues um, you know, uh, some, some of the, the, the purposes and objectives that we know jihadist groups are, 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 are pursuing, but with some differences. Um, so one of it is fighting infidels under their allies, um, apostates uh, in, in the Sahel, um, uh, you know, so they, 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 they try to, 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 to um, you know, fight what they consider as infidel government at the Salibiyin, they call them like the... Um, uh, uh, the Crusaders, who are the French, which is the, the, the bigger enemy, and then uh, there are the infidels who back them up. But there are also the Muslims who are who have become um, allies uh, to, the crusader, to the Crusaders and um, uh, the, 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 the infidels. So they, they, they are called them the apostates, and these are part of the group that also they, they target in, in, in their movement. Um, the ultimate goal is to overthrow the local government and then to establish um, um, the, the local government, which is called the, the Tawut, you know, the, 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 the infidel tyrants. Um, and they're replacing it with an Islamic state, uh, which will ultimately become part of the larger caliphate that they try to, to, to establish, uh, which will go from, from Iraq, um, uh, you know, from Bilal Sham to, 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 to uh, 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 everywhere in, in the Muslim land in the world. Um, but the difference between... Um, the, which, which, what, what differentiate them, I think, between other jihadist groups, and in particular, um, the other jihadist group, I think that we, you did at uh, the last uh, webinar on Jinim, um, is that the Islamic, the ISGS tends to extend uh, its definition of apostasy um, to include almost everyone who is not, who does not agree with them, you know, and this provides them with um, a justification to wage war against anybody um, who is not them, actually, including the civilians, etc. And this is not why they do not shy away um, from engaging in mass um, killing of local civilians. And we saw that um, numerous times um, in northern uh, uh, Tilaberi in, in Niger, across the border, I mean, between Niger and, and Mali, up to um, the region of Tawa, Tilia, we saw all this mass killing that they did, and they assume it, they, they do not shy away from it. Um, lastly, uh, the drivers. Um, so there are many drivers that that uh, that that, um, that you can mention, but here I will just focus on two on, on two main drivers. The first is the disorder. Um, I think there is a common saying now that has become accepted that jihadists exploit disorder, um, uh, a pre-existing disorder. 
And in the case of the Islamic State, yes, they did exploit, um, uh, they benefited from, from, from um, an old, I mean, several conflicts that were going on in the region, including conflict between pastoralists, um, between co communities of pastoralists, including the, the Fulani pastoralists, and then the, the Tuareg pastoralists, both the Dausak and, and the Imgad. Um, in, in, in this area, they have also exploited another, um, uh, you know, conflict between the Fulani uh, pastoralists and uh, the Jerma community, um, uh, the, 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 who are most of them agricultural um, uh, farmers. Um, and uh, if you look at the, the way that they exploited it is that um, they sided with one side first, who, who are, in, in, in this case, the Fulani, um, uh, they, they sided with them and they recruited them. Most of the people that the ISUS recruited come from an earlier militia that was created to fight or to protect uh, Fulani communities from exactions that are coming from, from, from the Daushak. Um, this is the, the major constituency, and this is actually one of the reasons why they are established um, in this area. Um, but they do not only exploit disorder, they also transform disorder, and disorder transforms them. You know, um, uh, if you look at the, their bases today uh, on the border between Niger and Mali, you will see um, actually that um, uh, in, in the same compound, in the same camp, in the same markers, you'll find Fulanis, you'll find Dosak, you'll find Jarma, and you'll find um, uh, Tuareg Imgad. Um, all of them at the same time. So they have gone beyond um, those earlier cleavages between those two groups. They have transformed the cleavage and in a way that they bring together uh, communities, uh, people from communities that used to fight each other. Um, um, uh, so so I, I can expand on that too um, at, at later stage. And the last problem is the problem of governance. Um, the driver, I think, is a problem of governance on the, on the, si on the, on the uh, side of the state. Um, uh, and uh, I, I think it is commonly agreed that the state in these rural areas has a bad reputation. Uh, it's it's um, um, not only the government has been um, lacking capacity to regulate, to provide service, um, you know, to resolve conflict, regulate access to natural resources, etc. But the behavior um, of uh, arm, uh, of um, state and defense groups have been um, uh, marked by abuse to local population. So we have a state that has manifested itself more through repression and the abuse of power rather than the, pro the, the provision of services. And that this uh, actually um, uh, really angered people. And that's why I said, if you go to this area before even the jihadists come in and you speak about the state, you have a negative uh, sentiment from the local populations. I will stop here and, and, and uh, I'll look forward to, to further discussions on these issues. No, absolutely. Did a, a great job again, as, as usual, succinctly, uh, <clears throat> you know, illustrating how this group you know, what are its, its goals? Uh, first, the withdrawal of foreign troops and, and then the establishment of Islamic rule in the, in the entire Sahel. And by Islamic rule, I mean, what they aim is to bring, you know, political systems and social practices in lines with their own interpretation of Islamic uh, law, Sharia, which is, which is quite, quite radical. And to achieve their goals, they have relied on several policies. I mean, they try to spread uh, over the largest possible geographical area. They try to exhaust the army and security forces. Uh, and they also try to gain popular support. But it was nice how we draw a distinction between them and other violent extremist groups, particularly J and I am, or your name, and how they tend to extend uh, what, you, what you said, this apostasy to anyone that does not agree with, with them. So I like it, Jay uh, and I am what we saw on April 7th, that that, that group you know, sought compromise with, with residents in place they control. They try to maintain traditional power structures. They also allowed officials to manage uh, their affairs. So uh, 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 so-called Islamic State in Greater Sahara adopts a, a different uh, approach. And he talked about what fuels the group uh, and how they exploit uh, uh, disorder. Uh, and I liked your expression, how they transform disorder and how disorder transformed them uh, uh, as well. You know, they managed to transform those cleavages and to expand their, their membership. And then you ended up with the you know, the problem of, of, of governance, state governance, you know, state uh, uh, abuse and, and sometimes uh, 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 repression. So that takes us to the second uh, uh, question, uh, Ibrahim, uh, about the membership structure of, of this group. I mean, 
uh, and, and also if you can touch on the significance that uh, uh, you know women play in the structure Right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Anwar. And this is really a good question about um, how, how are they organized? Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, and uh, it, there's one characteristic about uh, the ISGS is that um, this is a group in which, uh, you know, uh, foreign jihadists who uh, normally in a normal world do not have anything to do with this region, um, but were able to come and establish themselves more strongly and recruit um, uh, local populations to create this um, uh, very murderous, um, uh, very, very bad uh, group. And I, it, I think it struck everybody that how did they succeed in achieving this? Um, uh, you know, what, 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 what did they do? Um, so, so let me talk first about the, 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 the major leaders. Um, the, the, the two main leaders up to last year were Sahrawis. Um, this is Abdul, Abdul uh, Abu Walid Sahrawi, um, uh, and uh, who is Adnan Abu Walid Sahrawi, and then Abdul Hakim Al Sahrawi. And as you could realize, uh, only from the names, those two come from Western Sahara, and uh, their trajectory is uh, is is is, is um, uh, not very well known. But um, they started in Northern Sahara. This they 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 I think um, passed through. Um, uh, Tinduf, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the refugee camp, the Polisario refugee camp in, in southern Algeria. Um, and then uh, from there, I think they got connections with um, the Algerian jihadists in southern Algeria and they become recruited. In any ways, uh, they became known really after um, the invasion of Gao. For people in Gao, they knew them a, a bit before, um, uh, right? A few months before the, the invasion, because they were they were they were settling in um, uh, Tablig, uh, um, uh, you know, with the Tablig groups at that time before even the invasion of Gao. But then after the invasion, um, they, they they played the role, um, the leader role within Mujawo, um, with Abu Ali the Sahrawi as the, 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 the head of the Majlis Shura. Um, the, the, the advisory council, and then um, Abdul Hakim running um, uh, the, the, the city um, uh, in terms of security, et cetera. So um, th these are the, th this is the head, but uh, now the, the two of them have been eliminated um, uh, last year. Um, the, the new leadership is, I mean, there are a lot of rumors that, that are being thrown around. I don't want to um, uh, provide names um, uh, that are not totally established, but there are a few names that circulate. Um, uh, uh, about about who is the new leader um, of the group, um, but it might be uh, I think uh, an Arab, um, uh, either a Sahrawi or an Arab from 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 the local areas um, uh, from the local area. Um, there is so, so this is regarding the you know the the leadership the the top leaders uh, in terms of the structure of the organization of the, the organizational structure, and then the the leadership relies on a majlis shura to make decisions. And uh, um, there are very, uh, very little is known about the Majlis Shura, um, except that it is uh, uh, believed to be to come. Uh, the, the leader is to, uh, some important members of the Majlis Shura are believed to come from the Arab communities um, uh, in uh, southern, in 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 the Gao, in 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 that part of of, of uh, southern Gao. Um, you know, th there is a small village that had become infamous, um, which is in Araban. Um, a small Arab village uh, that that um, uh, almost everything uh, you know uh, uh, you know clatter around around around, around that village, and that they are believed that some of the leaders of Majlis Shura are based um, uh, or come from from those um, Arab communities and who are the running the show behind the scene behind the the, the leaders that we see. Um, then there are several local lieutenants uh, from Niger, uh, Mali, and Burkina Faso, I think you have several dozens of them actually, um, that are in charge of conducting the operations um, in different grounds locally. And um, uh, I think we can throw a lot of names here, whether in Niger, in Mali, in Niger you have um, those who have been, uh, are, are, are the leaders, Issa Barei, you know, you have um, uh, Usman Elias Ujibo, who is Petitia Fori, both of them are in the um, reward of justice list for of the United States. Um, you have also Malam Yunusa, uh, uh, Abdul Chawangel, etc. Um, on the Burkina Faso side, you have Sadu Idris Atambura, who replaced Ab uh, Abdul Hakim after he died. 
um, and uh, it's a, a, a jihadist from, from, from the Sum area, from Tongo Mile in particular. Um, and then um, uh, in, on, the, on the Malian side, you have Musa Mumuni, um, uh, who is also one of the top leaders, um, particularly in the Gurma area, operating um, uh, for, 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 for several years now. Uh, and then you have hundreds of uh, ranking files that have different backgrounds, different motivations. Um, uh, there is no one thing that, that motivates them. And, and we can come back to talk about different constituencies, those who join because of uh, protecting their communities, those who join because they are bandits from before, et cetera. So, so this is very difficult to, to track down. Now, regarding women, um, uh, you know, jihad is uh, in the sense of taking up weapons and going to the, to, to the bush to fight. This is a man job. It's not a um, woman um, job. And uh, jihadists actually rarely allow um, women to go to the markets in the bushes um, to fight. Um, though uh, there are some footage, video footage that are published um, uh, a few years ago in which that led observers to start saying that maybe some women have participated in some of their battles, uh, but, but I wouldn't make it, I wouldn't be making that argument. I think I will, share, I will, I will be more, uh, um, what we know from the jihadists after all these years is that women stay at home, but they do play a role, um, even from home. They participated in preaching and, um, uh, you know, spreading the ideology, particularly among women and girls. Um, they, uh, uh, they, 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 they constitute, uh, they, they facilitate recruitment. They, are trans they, they pass facilitate transmission of messages uh, from external actors to their husbands who are in, 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 the, in the bush. Um, uh, so I actually met some humanitarian organizations, uh, actors from humanitarian organizations who told me that, that because the men are always in the bush, so when they need to send, um, you know, letters of information to the, the men in the bush, they talk to the women um, who stayed back in the village, and then the women will transmit the message um, to the men. Um, so, so this is how, how it works, and it happened with, with uh, uh, jihadists from ISGS. Um, regarding youth, uh, let us say that um, uh, jihadists uh, do not shy away. In this area, they do not shy away from recruiting um, uh, young people. Uh, I think um, uh, it is... It's not, it's not anything similar to what we saw in Sierra Leone or Liberia during those wars where, where, where thousands of youth, et cetera, committed mass atrocities. It's not in the same scale, um, but here too, there are uh, quite a bit of evidence of recruitment of young people. Excellent, sir. Thank, thank you, Ibrahim. I described the, uh, the complexity of the membership composition of, of the group, and we have described how this group has having. I think two to three main components that define its membership structure. So we talked about the, the leadership, mainly the ideological component, a uh, few individuals uh, from where the exercise of leadership tends to flow them. Then you describe the second component, which might be the most fragmented, uh, but they share some degree of, of, of ideology. These are the, the local lieutenants that, that you described again, very, very well from Burkina and elsewhere. And then the third component is uh, the largest right of the pyramid, which is the fighters. Uh, uh, and that constitutes the bulk of the movement that are motivated, not necessarily by ideology, right? By grievances based on uh, how their communities are politically marginalized, how they are economically you know, uh, excluded. Some join, as we know, because of, uh, you know, uh, for protest, seeking protection, uh, others, uh, you know, to seek revenge, et cetera. Uh, women and youth, they play complex and nuanced role in, in violent e extremism. Uh, so again, context matter. That's why it's good that you distinguished it from, from others in Somalia or elsewhere here. Uh, but they do play a, a, nuanced, um, a nuanced role because they, they tend to represent strategic human resources for these groups. As you said, they can facilitate transmission of direct messages, and, um, et cetera. But also most women play a positive role, obviously, uh, you know, challenging these groups, uh, obviously. And so that uh, takes me to the last question for you, Ibrahim. Uh, if you can talk a little bit about the facets of uh, the war economy, you know, of, the, of this group uh, and, and income, you know, uh, generation. I think it's important to have better clarity here with the political economy of violence ex extremism, because we have a classic, I think, war economy, and, and this group seems to be a central player there. 
Uh, so it's critical to the group's endurance, right? It's, it's, it's this ability to generate resources because they have to, in the end, to pay their fighters and their personnel. They have to cover the operational costs. They have to buy goods. You know, they have to carry out attacks and missions. So, so if you can document for us uh, uh, the multifaceted means by which uh, this group generates funds, that would be very helpful. Well, definitely, yes. And um, uh, this is, of course, a very crucial component um, of an insurgency. It is um, how do they mobilize the resources um, that they use in order to, to, to organize themselves and to conduct the, 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 uh, the insurgency. Um, I think there are several, uh, first of all, there are obvious um, things that we know um, that they uh, rely on in terms of collecting, and there are others who are less obvious, you know. But there, there are suspicions that they they they, that they do engage, they, they do receive source um, income from them. The first that are um, the well known um, is what they call the zakat, which is zakat is a, an Islamic, as you know, and what is an Islamic concept, um, uh, one of the pillars of of Islam. Um, but they, you know use it in their own, um, subverted it, I think, in, in, for, for, for their own sake. Um, and this is coming to the village to, to collect um, taxes based on um, uh, heads of livestock. You know, they will count 40 lives, 30 livestock, you get um, uh, one cow or, or of age three, etc. I mean, there, there is a system of calculation of how do you, um, you know, uh, uh, pay taxes. Uh, uh, in, in, according to the Islamic rule, and this is what they implement on local population. So they rely heavily um, on on collecting um, zakat um, from 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 the local groups, and um, there are several examples of of them collecting zakat uh, locally. How they do it? Actually, uh, they, they have performed the system in the way that when they collect, they give uh, a receipt. You know. Um, uh, and then uh, so if somebody comes back, uh, they will uh, show the receipt uh, uh, because there are several commanders who, who can go from different places and then they, are, they, 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 they will not. But, but this hasn't worked that much because you have several people who have paid zakat multiple times a year. You have cases in which people have paid zakat four times a year, um, three times a year, uh, et cetera. It was supposed to be once, to be paid once annually. Um, but but um, uh, the, 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 there is abuse uh, from them in terms of collecting zakat all in this area. And that, uh, this is one of the things that really uh, brings, brings anger between them and the local population. Um, there is also um, raids and um, uh, 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 of the so-called enemies livestock or enemies um, uh, properties. Uh, and uh, in properties in this area really means livestock most of the time. Um, so if they, they, they know that in this village, um, uh, this village collaborates with the, the army or, or the, the, the state in general, um, they will come and raid all their animals, you know, and uh, take all, every, all the livestock uh, that, that they get from it. Or if they, if they knew um, that there is a livestock belonging to one big man in the States, a, a big uh, uh, army uh, person, you know, or a big politician, they will also come to raid the animals locally. So the, this has con uh, this have led to really massive looting um, of, uh, of, of livestock uh, from local communities. And this is also one of the things that has been really hard um, on, on many villagers um, in, in the area. Um, sec uh, uh, third thing is the smuggling of goods. Um, uh, this is known that they, they are engaged in smuggling of a lot of goods, some um, of actually up to the a border with uh, Niger and Nigeria, you know, from the Sokoto area, etc. So they go there to, um, uh, you know, get all the goods that they need, um, uh, fuel, um, uh, motorcycles, uh, food, etc. And they also go from the border with Benin um, uh, to go through. So, so this one, once is Nigeria, uh, Niger, the road between Nigeria and Niger, and then um, the, um, the border of Mali, or Benin, Burkina Faso, and the border of Mali. Um, uh, and actually, some of them goes up, up, go up to Togo. So they have been um, using those, those rural, uh, uh, you know, smuggling uh, uh, roads uh, to, to, um, uh, to, 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 to supplement themselves to, with what they need. Um, there is non-industrial gold mining. Um, uh, this uh, in term, this is more is stronger in places that Jinim control, but uh, it is it, uh, ISGS also controls some few places where there is uh, gold, in particular in Burkina Faso, where there is um, uh, artisanal um, gold mining. 
And uh, sometimes uh, the jihadists impose zakat also um, on, on this, um, uh, as you know, and what we this is uh, the, 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 you know, the, the law in, in Islam, uh, which is in every mining uh, uh, um, income, you pay um, the one fifth of it. Um, so they have been implementing this on on local uh, on on local miners um, uh, who who have who who, who uh, you know dig mines uh, artisanal mines in this area. Um, the less obvious um, of their involve is their involvement in trafficking um, in in uh, in drug cigarettes um, uh, smuggling. Uh, there are good reasons to believe uh, that. Um, at least some of them are involved in this uh, business of, of trafficking. Um, there is a long history. First, first of all, there is a long history of collaboration with smugglers uh, in Northern Mali, as I mentioned, the Arab TLMC, who have become really uh, the leading figures in this, in this trafficking. Um, so from uh, the, the early 2000s, they have, they have been involved with this. And then um, uh, after even... After the, the, the occupation of Gao, uh, there have been involved in this. Even today, uh, there is a lot of suspicion of collaboration between um, uh, some of those traffickers with them. I think there are some evidence of, of, of good um, understanding between, between, the two, um, uh, between the two groups, the jihadists and the smugglers. Um, and they also control territories where we know that there's a lot of trafficking, um, where a lot of trafficking passes through you know uh, and it is unbelievable uh, that they are there and then all this trafficking happens with them not noticing it or of them not getting benefit out of it um uh, so there are a lot of I, I think reasons to believe that they are also getting uh, a cut um in the trafficking business uh, that, that that continues to proliferate uh, in this area excellent thank you uh, ibrahim uh, you described this diversified approach to, to financing and how this group exploits, you know, nature and vulnerabilities of local economies. Talked about smuggling and, and, and trafficking and how if the group controls territories of trafficking passes. So, so we can only assume that they at least benefit uh, from it. Uh, uh, you also discussed this concept of zakat, this religiously obligatory arm. Um, and how this group, uh, you know, it appropriates this this concepts for its own purposes, and to justify, you know, taxing civilians. You mentioned taxing miners. They also tax pastoralists uh, because the pastoralist mode of life suits them. Uh, the group's uh, mo modus operandi it's a largely mobile mobile group, so they can target. Uh, and they are mobile as well, so they can target a large mobile population. Uh, but they have also triggered a backlash by imposing levels of, of zakat that, that locals can, cannot, cannot bear. So now I'll turn to, uh, to Hassan uh, Kony. And before I do that, if you can, for, for our participants, uh, if you can submit questions in, into the chat. Uh, so don't wait till the end. At any time during the presentation, uh, again, we're keeping track of those and we'll try to answer them during the, the Q&A. So let's turn to, 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 uh, to Hassan. Hassan, Ibrahim did a, a great job giving us a, an understanding of the composition, the motivations, the objectives of the group. He also talked about the drivers that enables the so-called Islamic State in the Greater Sahara to, uh, to, uh, to, in, to, to endure. He also touched on the group's foreign connections. I mean, recently we heard uh, that the, this group uh, has acquired a new name, the, the so-called Islamic State Sahel province, uh, which is a new faction of the Islamic State Central. So if you, if you can talk about, you know, how, how meaningful are, are these connections, are these foreign connections, you know, and, and affiliations. So Hassan? Merci beaucoup. Donc, je... Hola. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to the Africa Center to invite me to participate in this seminar, which is an opportunity to share information on this very serious problem uh, concerning the terrorists um, in the in the area of the Sahel, and that is more and more moving towards uh, West African countries. So the link between between the Islamic State and these groups and the ISGS uh, come from the creation 
of two, two problems of allegiance that Ibrahim mentioned. At the time uh, that it was decided by Asawi to, to have an allegiance to, to ISGS and the Islamic State, there was a problem between him and, and the others. And from this conflict, Al Sahabi and his followers, not only the Arabs from north of Mali under Sultan Bayi, they decided to create the ISGS. So as but as Ibrahim said, it was seven, only 17, it took 17 months before they were uh, recognized by uh, the Al-Qaeda groups. So it was only after the situation in Nigeria that, um, that the Islamic State recognized this group. But one must realize that at the time, uh, they were not given the status of being an official province of the Islamic State. So even though they didn't have the full support of the Caliphate, they worked together. They used the name of the Islamic State to give themselves uh, more weight. In reality, um, all of this to worked. He worked as a kind of franchise, Al Sawai, and he was able to get his own resources, as was mentioned by Ibrahim, and this problem of the zakat, and so the stealing and looting of of the um, animals that were resold in the markets later, or or in other countries of West Africa. At the beginning, um, the, they, they, they tried to cooperate with JNM. And in 2019, they worked against a military uh, group of Burkina. But then the idea, the differences in ideology uh, led to differences and, and, and fights and combats. So the ISGS also tried to cooperate with the Islamic, with other uh, groups in Burkina Faso and to cooperate to, but they were recruiting, they were recruiting more members from that area. But where we see them trying to work together with Akim, they joined the, they were trying to join the, become a province of the Islamic State. And they were finally uh, recognized by ISWAP, ISWAP. In so their work was in the region of the three borders of Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, Niger, but also Nigeria and the Lake Chad Basin. So we speak a lot of the jihadists from Boko Haram that went to support uh some of these operations that they were taking place in the field and i have been told there was conflict between the fighters from the uh, different groups uh, Tuare, one was a Tuare group the people from the region near Nigeria, they would hear 
a lot of movement in the night of people going towards Mali. So that is just to say that we really speak of a support between the two groups. There are resources that also say that some of the, some, the way in which they shared the, the results of their looting um, uh, and would exchange guns for money it was also realized, but the official recognition of um, these movements of the Islamic State before the death of Abdali, we see a video where he encouraged these groups to continue their attacks against the French forces and the local forces, military forces. Uh, January 10, 2020, Islamic State also uh, showed a video for the first time that speaks of the Sahelian branch um, of the ISGS. So whether it's the ISGS, uh, uh, whether it was ISGS that uh, took credit for certain operations or the Islamist State. And until March 2022, uh, there was the, the, they became a Wailiad, so a state, a province of the Islamic State. Into this proximity between the groups, there was a recent study that was published in May by Kyert, uh, and it was entitled uh, Terrorist Combatants, Foreign Combatants in the Sahel Region. In this study, um, there, they showed there was a link between Daesh, between the Sahelian provinces. Now, with the collapse of Daesh on the other side, there are still 5,000 foreign combatants that have joined, that have come to the Sahel region. So if this data is confirmed, uh, we must realize that there is reinforcement coming in to these groups, foreign combatants that were part of Daesh that are coming into the region to support uh, this group. And the, they have expertise in creating, creating IED, IEDs and et cetera. Thank you. Um, talked about the influence of, um, you know, this foreign uh, influence and uh, the connections with, with ISWAP, uh, uh, especially since March 2019. So does this tend to push the local dimensions of the armed insurrection into the background? If so does it make the ideological facet uh, more salient uh, instead, because this is critical because that leads me to the second question to you, uh, uh, Hassan, which is, you know, what's, what's the place for this group in the political landscape of the countries where it operates? In other words, uh, you know, should this group be, you know, included in, say, negotiations? You know, there's a lot of talk about dialoguing with this with these groups right especially j j and m and we discussed this on our last webinar april um, uh, 7th so uh, if, if if so how viable you know is, is dialogue with it because if you listen to the sahelian leaders they view you know this group as 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 as, as you said it's either driven by foreign barat extremists or as foreign criminals who have come to sow terror in in, in their country. So it's impossible to find a common ground with them. So they don't consider, you know, the leadership of this group to be uh, legitimate interlocutors with whom they can discuss, you know, what's fueling the insurgency, basically legitimate grievances, rural governance, economic neglect, you know, intercommunal attention, et cetera. So I'd um, be interested to hear your, 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 uh, your views on this, Hassan. As my brother Ihab Ibrahim said, the groups are, are based on essentially on a pyramidal design. The, the top of the pyramid is a core, and that is composed of these foreigners, and these people are radicalized. These are truly radicalized 
people. They are truly convinced of the Salafist doctrine. Um, and so in dialogue with these people is uh, really unrealistic because these people are so convinced of uh, Daesh's ideology. They just want to um, create a caliphate and the current states must go away and they've, there has to be a caliphate. So these foreigners that are at the very top of the pyramid uh, uh, are not people with whom you can negotiate. However, the base of the pyramid, as Ibrahim said, the, this base is composed of fighters who are Nigerian or Malian or Burkina based These people are, were recruited. And as Ibrahim said, during recruitment, um, ISGS essentially played on the vulnerabil vulnerabilities that existed within these populations. So the majority of these people joined these groups and, and we have seen this, they have joined for reasons that are other, that are not about ideology. They're just people who want to protect themselves uh, because, you know, as Ibrahim talked about the zakat, you know, say they come to you and they say, you have a hundred heads of cattle, uh, pay or we're no longer going to protect you against thieves. So people uh, decide to join these groups to protect themselves. But so they're trying to protect their property or their families. Uh, from other non-state armed groups, or and sometimes from the security forces. And sometimes these people join these groups because they were victims of something and they want to take revenge uh, for these ills that were done to them. And so you have to understand that the state is absent from a lot of these spaces. So, you know, a lot of this is based on frustrations associated with social injustice, uh, the lack of basic services, uh, access to water, access to education. It, you know, all of this, all of these factors have pushed these people to, to find a purpose within these groups these terrorist groups and that, that they could not find, that could not be provided by the state. So I think the states have understood this. Uh, so the extended hand from the Nigerian president uh, right now, they're, they're the reach, uh, he's trying to reach out to these regions. So, and he's trying to integrate uh, local elected leaders in the communities and traditional leaders to, to try and establish a dialogue with these people. And, and for me, this dialogue is the first step towards DDR because this can essentially constitute a demobilization of these individuals you know, and, and, and take them away from those who recruited them. So this dialogue uh, can only be viable if the states take responsibility and understand that they must address the causes of these people being recruited. They must ensure a, a basic level of protection. They must ensure a basic level of social services. Um, and, and they need to establish how to uh, manage issues between uh, pastoralists and uh, farmers. So this, you know, this has been done before. Algeria has worked, worked for 10 years uh, to establish the Concord, uh, the, Concord uh, the civil Concord uh, to essentially uh, break up the base of the pyramid. Mauritania did a little bit of, of this type of work as well. Uh, so first, they Mauritania initiated a policy where it's, it, it established a dialogue with Salafists who were in prison and established programs for the construction of new cities, uh, the creation of services, uh, professional training. You know, so, so this has been done before. I think in Niger, in the Difa region, uh, there's a, a an authority that has been established and that is working in this direction. So it's a, a good project. Yes, it's critical to understand that 
components of the membership structure of this group. Uh, so there's the ideological component, uh, which you know uh, there is not not much to to uh, to, the, to discuss to discuss there. And in any case, those uh, are the ideological of the leadership and the level their overarching strategies, their refusal to talk with state authorities. So they have rejected any suggestion of dialogue with the Sahelian leaders whom they consider as uh, Brian said infidels. But the most interesting is those at the second or third layer, uh, you know, those local commanders or the fighters that constitute the bulk of the movement. And these are that are motivated as we discussed uh, earlier, as you nicely uh, articulated, you know, by uh, you know, political, socioeconomic uh, uh, grievances. So uh, the, the interest of time will go to the, to, to the last questions and, uh, and if we can uh, be uh, uh, succinct as, as you have been. Uh, thank you, Hassan. So based on your research, what is the most important finding to inform, you know, uh, uh, the current responses to this group? And you already touched on, on, on some of these in, in the second question. So the answer is that since this phenomenon be began in the Sahel, the the approach that was uh, favored, it was really a, a security approach. Uh, people thought, okay, we need to strengthen our armies, we, we need to equip them, and they will answer the problem, they will take care of the problem. It'll be like a conventional war, essentially, and we can win in the field. However, these groups have been very resilient. Uh, they, they've really, they, they, this means that today, this purely security approach, uh, you know, there's uh, the, the all the forces that are taking part in this combat, all these forces brought together have been unable to defeat these groups because these groups have developed localized strategies and, and a strategy that is really based on their own resilience. They, they've been able to recruit a, a lot of people because of the lack of the state's presence, the lack of justice um, within these countries, within these regions. So, you know, 2012, 2000 thing, this, this has this was the beginning of this phenomenon and, and the approach that has been used has shown that it is very limited. Um, now there was the approach that was used in Algeria. You had a strong army, but in 10 years they couldn't accomplish anything. So they had to start taking on a political approach. There was the summit of Po in uh, uh, January 5th, 2020. So, you know, the, the forces uh, the the operation Barkhane, etc. Um, they by eliminating the leader of ISGS, nothing was accomplished. The the group still exists. It continues to commit acts in in the region. So we really need to revise the response that has been used up to now. So. Bakan and Takuba, okay, you have these foreign forces that are there and, and they're going to modify the way they operate, obviously. They're, they're not going to have as many men in the field, that's clear. So that means that local leaders and the leaders of the relevant countries need to understand that they need to take a much more holistic approach to this issue. So we need to strengthen military capacities, but to maintain pressure on the groups. But at the same time, you need to have this political work that needs to be done that, you know, uh, initiates development projects in these regions in order to uh, eliminate uh, the, these reasons for, for people joining these groups. And this, so now coastal countries within uh, West Africa can see this threat is coming towards them as well. And that 
they they understand you know everybody needs to understand that you must have a much more holistic approach that you must avoid the vulnerabilities that enable these groups to prosper one of the biggest problems now is uh, really this pastoralist pastoralist crisis, which is, uh, you know, which is very uh, present within the three borders area, which is present in Benin and, and other areas. So as long as we don't fight to resolve these vulnerabilities, you know, military uh, forces are not going to be able to defeat this scourge. Absolutely. I mean, this this brings us to the to to the end of this uh, 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 to the end of the presentations, and then we'll move to the to the uh, Q and A. Uh, but you are absolutely right. I mean, the public, as we have seen, has become dissatisfied with this purely military approach to dealing with the insurgents. And so, and in any case, the present approach is clearly not not working. I mean, truly, have inflicted heavy losses on on the you know, so-called Islamic State Bridge Sahara. But so far, they have failed to quash the group or even to secure zones that they have undertaken from, 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 from the militants. So we need to reorient this approach. Uh, um, so we already have uh, some questions on, 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 on the chat here. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask, uh, so we'll go through probably two rounds quickly. Uh, so we'll have another uh, 10 minutes or, or so and we will end this, this webinar. So the first question is, Will uh, this group, uh, ISGS, uh, tend to control and administer a large area between Mali and Niger as uh, ISIS did, uh, or Daesh, as ISIS did in, in Iraq? Uh, so the, another question is about the recent uh, JNM uh, uh, ISGS non-aggression pact. So uh, is this a tactical ceasefire to respectively focus on each territorial areas? And, and how might uh, uh, JNEM react if, uh, if uh, the so-called Islamic State of Greater Sahara would take over territory with cities like, uh, like Memaka? Uh, another question is how can illegal immigration and gold mining be tackled in the Sahel region? And has there, um, uh, so, uh, on dialogue, and this is to, to, to Hassan, but also to Ibrahim, because he has done a lot of work in this. How can these people at the top of the pyramid be, you know, prevented? Uh, uh, so is dialogue feasible with the so-called Islamic State base uh, without the summit here, not agreeing to it, without the leadership agreeing to it? And if they do, wouldn't that be, in fact, just for tactical convenience? useful mainly just for this group's medium and long-term aims. Uh, and the uh, final question on, on, on this, and I'll open it up to the uh, panelists, is also on dialogue for, for, uh, for Hassan. It's in French. Uh, what do the governments within uh, the Sahel region, what could they propose uh, during these negotiations? We'll go to a to second round. So if we can just be, you know, uh, as you have been, so thank you, uh, brief and, and succinct, I would appreciate it. So we'll start with uh, Ibrahim, you want to take it? Yes, thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, and great presentation also by Hassan. Yeah. Um, and uh, very relevant questions um, that, that, uh, that, that um, the participant asked. Um, regarding uh, the first one, um, which is, uh, will ISGS be able to control large territories? Uh, so far, what has been what distinguished ISGS is not its ability to uh, organize um, a local governance uh, in the way that Janim has done um, in several places, whether in Central Mali, whether in um, uh, you know Abaybara, etc., in certain areas in Mali uh, or in Burkina Faso. Um, we haven't ISGS has not been that. Um, uh, you know, organized in the way that they could constitute a state, a work, working state. Um, the, their style of governance has not been very uh, promising. Um, uh, so I, I, I'm, I mean, they, they, are, they have a huge capacity to inflict damage, um, uh, you know, to kill people, to instigate uh, local communities, intercommunal violence, um, uh, to exploit intercommunal violence. Um, but what do they propose beyond violence has not been uh, great. 
um, so I would doubt um, uh, about their ability to, uh, uh, of course, um, they, they would like to have a large territory that they will, uh, or that, that, that they could control, but what do they do after they control that large territory is, is not something that we, we, we saw that was very promising. I, I think you, you, in, in terms of controlling territory, you have to understand ISGS has been as struggling, uh, uh, particularly right now, um, to have a space in which they can operate um, beyond all the threats that comes from, from, from it is opponent, you know? So uh, uh, their, their, their space of operation has been tightening um, over the last uh, two, three years um, uh, due to uh, um, a, a, a battle between them and, and, and Janim, um, uh, the, the presence of, uh, so this is pr putting pressure on them uh, from the, the Guruma side of, of, of the, the, the Niger River Bank um, uh, from, north, from the north um, toward Gao, uh, but also um, the presence of the Chadians uh, on, on, the, on, 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 the, on the other side of the, the, the river um, from the Niger and Burkina Faso side of, of, of the border. You know? so, so they have left with this little spot um, uh, which is those, this, this is uh, across the border between Niger and Mali, this, this small territory. And it is very dangerous for a jihadist group to find, it, to find itself into a small space because then it is easier um, uh, to be located and bombed or, or, or attacked. They need space in order to, 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 to maneuver. Um, so I think that was one of the reasons why we saw a huge spread of the group toward the east, you know, um, uh, toward the border, uh, toward Tawa, Tilia, et cetera, North Tassara, we saw these groups moving, um, to, 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 uh, I mean, more heavily um, to, to create a larger space for it to maneuver. And, but but it, is, it is nothing um, of controlling and exercising governance. It is just um, out of survival. This is the point that I was, I was trying to make. Um, the, the second question regarding the temporary ceasefire, we got to uh, agree that um, the relationship between uh, ISGS and, um, uh, and, and the Jinim is, is, is bad. Um, uh, they could do uh, temporary ceasefires in certain locations um, uh, to try to, to um, you know, to survive, um, <laughs> both of them. Um, but uh, both of them call the others um, infidel, apostate, etc. There is, you, you read uh, uh, all the documents or the commentary that they make, Every time that ISGS mentioned um, Iyada Ghali or Kufa, they will say Al-Murtad, you know, uh, the apostates, Kufa Al-Murtad, you know, all the Jinim Al-Murtad, Al-Qaeda Al-Murtad, et cetera. All of them, everybody is apostate. Um, so, and this is how they legitimize um, uh, uh, engaging them into, into battle. Uh, so the, the, I don't think there is a way to, to, to uh, for, from this ideological perspective, that I don't think there's a way really to, 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 to recover um, uh, to th this 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 um, uh, gap, I, I mean, to, to fill in the, the, the gap between the two and, and bring both together as before to collaborate. Um, but the necessity of uh, operational, uh, you know, pressures could push them um, in certain places to to accommodate one one another. Um, and this is what we saw actually in the I saw a, a question about Menaka. So far. There hasn't been but now that there is a little bit, um, uh, particularly in in um, people are saying that. To, so why in in the in the in the eastern part of the river bank there haven't been confrontation between ISCS and Jinim, uh, but recently there have. We saw the 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 the, the fighting taking place um, uh, in this in in the house side of, of the river bank, um, and and this 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 could actually continue. There is nothing that that prevents this from happening. It's just that. Um, over history, there have been close relationship between certain leaders on both sides who were talking to each other and trying to, to, to you know, to, to, um, to negotiate and, and, and establish good understanding between the two groups. And so far, these linkages are still there. And I think that prevents it from happening. But there is a lot of pressure on those, on those, on those understandings and, and, and um, you know, um, uh, 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 on, on the local, uh, lo local uh, at the local side. Um, so is, is this going to be sustained? We have to wait and see, but I, I see a lot of battleground already taking place in, in the other side. We'll, we'll have to wait and see how, how it evolves. And also there is recently um, uh, ISG is trying to move up to the north. You know, um, it is okay as long as they stay in their spot, in, in this little spot that they occupy now. But if they decide to move up north, northern Menaka, 
um, uh, then that would be toward Tiderman, etc. This is the area of operation of Jinim, and if they try to go that far, um, it's going to backfire. Um, definitely. So we'll have to wait. And I see already C CMA being really very um, cautious about um, the jihadist uh, ISGS moving that north, not in the northern part. Um, dialogue. How how can people? Um, no. How how can these people at the top be be organized regarding? Dialogue, and I agree with everything that said um, Hassan. Yes, definitely, uh, there is no military solution to this. Um, we have to find other solutions. One of the solutions is to engage them. ISGS is particularly difficult to engage from the government side because um, they, uh, first of all, because they are considered to be too radicalized um, uh, for discussions. And this is even the international community, even Gutierrez, you know, when he says that it is possible to engage in dialogue. With, he said with, uh, he, he mentioned he, he hinted to the fact that it is okay to 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 negotiate with al qaeda side of, of the jihadist groups but he said there are other groups that are too radicalized that we cannot talk about yeah. and uh, i think we, we understood um, that he mentioned he, he was meaning isgs sure. um so even governments locally consider them to be too radicalized um international community considers them to be too radicalized and the third, the, the other thing is that they, they also are governed by, uh, led by the, the foreigners. Um, so it was clearly a red, um, uh, you know, it's a no go for the Nigerian government to engage the Sahrawis in, in dialogue. I um, mean, the Nigerian government say that we are open to engage in dialogue, but not with the Sahrawis, um, only with our local lieutenants um, who are Nigerians who may have legitimate um, grievances toward the government of Niger, and these are the ones that do that, that you can uh, call out that you can dialogue with. The problem is that yeah. those lo local lieutenants um, uh, get all their instructions from the top, and unless the top allows them to do, um, uh, they, they will not do. So the Nigerian government found itself into this very complicated um, yes. uh, context. Okay. Um, I think, I think, yeah. All right. That's okay. So. Yes. Uh, I, yeah, I'll go to, to Hassan for the sake of time, but, but great answers. Uh, thank you. Hassan? As, as Ibrahim was saying, the dialogue with the very top of the pyramid, I, I'm not saying it's completely impossible, but it, it is a dialogue that seems unlikely where there has been a dialogue. And, you know, Algeria established a dialogue under its civil concord policy. And they, they, they were talking to um, people who were so radicalized that nothing was possible, you know, and, and these were Al-Qaeda uh, people who, are, who have a different idea than the whole caliphate, you know, da uh, Daesh caliphate. Uh, but once they are so radicalized, is they're just going to say, just leave the government to us so we can establish our rule. No, so the Nigerians, uh, the, the basic elements do not uh, follow the Salafist ideology, you know, these, these uh, lower levels of the pyramid have have joined because they had um, issues, not because of ideology. So now in the Lake Chad Basin, uh, there there have been uh, the, the same issues. The majority uh, of the people within the Katibas are Fulani. These people go to the communities, they come out of the communities. The, the government is trying to establish contact and trying to establish these, these relationships through uh, community channels to talk to these people, to try and identify why they joined these groups and to understand what their complaints are, what their issues are. And so these trans-border regions, unfortunately, in all the development policies of our countries, all these regions have been forgotten, neglected. The, the northern Mali, northern Burkina Faso, um, this border area between Mali and Niger, they've, they've been forgotten completely. And so the people in these regions have also um, been submitted to abuses and extortion. Uh, 
So, you know, the security forces have abused populations in, in all of these uh, areas based on information they obtained, but there are also armed, other armed groups, bandits, um, the Ptolemy Fulani of Niger, they were victims uh, of raids uh, that took place. They, they needed um, to protect themselves against another ethnic group, but the state wasn't there to protect them, to help them. So what can the countries give these people, you know, in, uh, in this type of approach? So this is not about two partners talking around a table. This is this dialogue is really a, a type of demobilization. So we have to establish the channels through which we can communicate with them and make them understand that the state uh, will undertake uh, processes to help these people. Uh, so in order to the state can establish transitional justice, you know, so those who do not have too much blood on their hands could be exonerated in some cases, for example. Um, so, you know, this happened uh, in Mauritania and Algeria. They they did this. Thank you. I mean, I, I, I know the conversation can, we can keep it uh, 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 going, uh, uh, but I promised that we would have more of, uh, you know, discussions uh, on, on this uh, going uh, going going forward. So I think I'll just have to uh, uh, to wrap up uh, uh, briefly, uh, as uh, you know what what we have heard. Just to conclude, is that how it is extremely critical, you know, that uh, you know states, uh, regional governments, you know, the regional organizations, sorry, the international community, they all need to reorient their approach uh, to one that prioritizes, you know, governments that that uh, strives to attenuate escalating tensions among the communities and between communities and, and the state, especially in rural areas, uh, which these groups, they, they exploit. So we need, states need to redouble efforts to improve government's delivery of basic services to, uh, to, uh, to citizens, you know, as the crisis group, uh, uh, you know, Ibrahim, uh, you authored several uh, reports and as Hassan and, uh, you know, ISS you have all pointed out that the problem behind the current, you know, uh, crisis is, for the most part, is political. There's a lack of political representation of these border communities that many insurgents, they, they hail from, right? Uh, so in particular, the Fulani that live along the mali Niger border. So we need to go beyond security measures, which are obviously important and necessary. So they are essential, but they are insufficient. Because there was a question, a question there about, you know, why has the French uh, operation, uh, you know, Serval and uh, Barkhan, you know, failed to to address the the, the the threat? We didn't have time to 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 uh, to address that. But we need to go beyond these security measures, uh, you know, for uh, Niger and now the coastal areas. They need to develop preventive actions that slow down the the spread of. Uh, of violence. Authorities need to be concerned with preserving social cohesion by preventing, for example, the stigmatization of certain communities. To talk about that, that pyramid where the largest base is situated, those that join just out of grievance, not because of ideology. So states also need to develop, supervise the development of self-defense self groups. So, so again, we had, I think, a, a, a great conversation to, uh, uh, today. Uh, 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 Ibrahim, you have been great. Uh, Hassan, it's really a pleasure uh, to learn from from your insights. We'll continue this this conversation, you know, uh, in this platform and, and outside this platform since we are in, in, in touch. So, so thank you very much. I'm sure our participants, you know, would like to uh, extend their uh, uh, their appreciation, you know, for you taking the time today to come and, and share your 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 knowledge and. And insights uh, from from the, you know from the ground. So so thank you, Ibrahim, uh, uh, and merci Hassan. Thank you very. Thank much. you very much, Anwar, for for this. Thanks, thanks everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure. So we will conclude this. Uh, this webinar. Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup, Anwar, and merci beaucoup à tous. Thank students. you so much, Anwar, and thank you to all present. Thank you. Participants as well.